Welcome to Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClelland. On today's show, we have a very special guest, Clarence B. Jones. Now 83 years old, Jones was a speechwriter for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and he was his legal counsel. That's ahead on Cape Chronicle. Hey bud, where, uh, where are you headed? Uh, just gonna hang out. With Gary and Todd? Yeah. I've been meaning to ask you, is there any drinking going on in this crowd? No. If any of your buddies ever pressure you to take a drink, just tell them you promised your dad you wouldn't. I'd do anything to keep you safe. Okay, I will. I hope this is working. I promise. Love you too, Dad. They really do hear you. For tips on what to say, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. Cape Chronicle. I'm Jacob McClellan. Our guest today is Dr. Clarence B. Jones. He was the speaker at Southeast Missouri State University's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration dinner in January. He helped draft <coughs> King's famous I Have a Dream speech. Clarence Jones, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure to be here, sir. Well, here in a few minutes, I'd love to talk a little bit about the, <coughs> the famous I Have a Dream speech. Okay. But first, how did you um, get to become uh, Dr. King's legal counsel well, and part uh, of his inner circle? I have to try to uh, compress uh, seven and a half years <laughs> of history and about 60 seconds. I started out um, um, uh, working as a legal assistant uh, after Dr. King was invited, indicted by the state of Alabama for tax evasion in uh, February 1960. Fast forward is that um, his closest personal uh, advisor at that time was a fellow by the name of Stanley Levison. I eventually became involved in assisting Dr. King's preparation of the defense of his tax case and then began to work uh, with Stanley Levison in support of Dr. King's efforts. And one thing, uh, being a, um, uh, a legal assistant, um, uh, trans uh, got, uh, got, got expanded into doing informational memoranda about various uh, topics that he would uh, discuss, or that he would be asked to speak about. And then the informational memoranda got expanded into suggested language that he might use in a particular speech and uh, sooner or later, I found myself um, drafting um, the text of speeches that he would uh, use. Now, this arose really as a matter of the practical necessity and the reality of his schedule. He was, doc he was the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the organization's principal fundraiser. Uh, the more he was out on the circuit speaking and raising money, that sustained the organization in addition to the fundraising letter appeals and so that it was not possible for him to um, uh, go and s respond and speak at several, you know, on the weekends and on the week, weekdays, to these various uh, requests for him to speak and not have some kind of assistance. And so uh, Stanley Levison principally and myself secondarily filled in a, a, a very, provided a very valuable services. We provided textual material that he could consider using and that would give him a draft of material to work on since he didn't have the time to prepare it himself. And he developed great confidence in the accuracy of the information that, that we would provide, particularly in my case, because I was meticulous about uh, being sure that whatever I represented as a fact in a uh, piece of uh, suggested text was indeed a verifiable fact. So it, was, it, it just developed over a period of time, it appears that seven and a half years with respect to the specific speech, the I Have a Dream speech, is that um, uh, when it was announced that there was going to be a march on Washington in um, June of 1963, there was that whole period of time between June 1963 and the actual time when the, when the, the convocation of 250,000 people would take place and he would deliver his speech. Um, I had a chance to spend a, uh, some, some significant time with him in fact, he was staying in my home. I wasn't there. My wife and family vacated the home so that he could stay there during this period of time prior to the March on Washington so his family would have a, be able to have a vacation together. Uh, so that period of time, plus the night before, I had a chance to um, uh, uh, converse with him and to, prov to provide him with a summary of things which we had previously discussed 
so that um, I had no idea until I actually was listening to his speech. I had no idea that, in fact, he was going to use the suggested textual material. The suggested textual material, which I suggested and gave to him on the evening of August 27th, that he could incorporate it in his speech as he was working upstairs in his hotel suite, in the Willard Hotel. Um, he, I, was, I was a surprise. I'm sitting there listening to him, and as I'm listening, and I'm saying to myself, oh, okay, I guess he decided to use some of it, and as I'm listening, I see that he had decided to, for the, the first six paragraphs of the speech, verbatim, aside from the perfunctory uh, introductory sentence uh, of, you know, he gets up to speak, where the exact text of the draft that I had, of the suggested textual material. But I want to make it clear, the suggested textual material was a summary of what we had already talked about. And so it wasn't as if I was suggesting something new. He was really speaking about what we had already previously said should be the substance of what he should talk about. What were you, where were you during the time of the of, of this speech, and what was your was what, were, what was your personal reaction when you saw him using when you heard him I, using I was your standing uh, some summary? 50, I was standing some fifty feet behind him, and uh, and I and I after he was introduced, and I listened, and I see as I said earlier, I said, oh okay, and then as he's speaking, um, you know he he he, he, he speaks the the suggested textual material comprising the first six paragraphs of the speech. Then he moves into material that he himself had added on to that which I suggested. And so somewhere maybe, I don't know, maybe somewhere between fifth and sixteenth paragraphs of the speech, I, 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 I hear and see Mahalia Jackson, his favorite gospel singer, who was on the podium at the platform, the March on Washington. She shouts to him, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. So uh, I hear her clearly. Other people hear her clearly, but not everyone heard her clearly. And I see him when, he, when, he, when she shouts at him. He takes the written text, which he's reading from the lectern, and he moves the written text over to the left side of the lectern, and he grabs the lectern. This is all happening in real time and looks out at all those more than 250,000 people assembled. And I say to someone spontaneously, whoever that was standing next to me, I say, these people don't know it, but they're about ready to go to church. Because I could see that when he, when he decided to speak extemporaneously, he, he relaxed, his whole body language changed. And, he, and he, he, his body be, uh, developed into a stance of what I call the fourth generation Baptist preacher. So the balance of the speech from the time Mahalia Jackson shouted to him, tell him about the dream, Martin, until the end of the speech was spontaneous and extemporaneous. He did look down at near the end of the street, speech of notes when he was quoting um, uh, scripture about, uh, in the words of that old Negro preacher, so forth, free at last, free at last. But, but the balance of the speech thereafter was extemporaneous. Tell us a little bit about the <coughs> about the promissory note, the bad <coughs> check, and where that uh, where, where that example came from. In the, that in the example speech. came from the fact that, and that's why it was used very graphically. That example came from four months earlier, in April, in Birmingham. Um, uh, he was in jail. He was in jail. Uh, he went in jail April twelfth, on Good Friday, nineteen sixty three, and from and for the next four or five days while he was in jail. He actually wrote the letter from a Birmingham jail, but I won't go into that right now. I went in to see him because I wanted, we were having great problems because a number of young people who had followed him into, in, in, in participating in the street demonstrations, uh, 14, 16 year old kids, they were in jail also. And their parents were upset. Their parents wanted them to get out. And we didn't have enough bail money notwithstanding the fact we had support from the National Council of Churches and the United Automobile Workers and this and so forth, we simply did that not have enough. So one Friday, I'm staying at the AG Gasset Motel, one Friday, I'm, I go back to my motel with the heavy burden of what I'm going to do with these children because the parents recognize me 
You know, I'm the only one who could go in to see him, except for Arthur Shores. Nobody else could go in to see him. So when they, they knew that it was, quote, Dr. King's New York lawyer. So as soon as they saw me, you got to, what are you going to do about getting our children out of here? What are you going to do? So I got a call from Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte says, I think we may have an opportunity to get some bail money. I said, why? He says, how soon can you get out of here? I said, well, I'll try to get it. And then you got to get the first plane. So I go to New York. I go to New York. Harry Belafonte had had some discussions with the Rockefeller family. The Rockefeller family uh, wanted to help to provide bail money. Long story short is that I found myself on a Saturday morning. I, I took a plane out of Birmingham on Friday night, arrived early Saturday morning, called a certain, called a person I had to, was instructed by Harry to call, a fellow by the name of Hugh Morrow. Mr. Morrow says, well, can you, I would like you to meet us at the bank on uh, the Chase, the headquarters of Chase Manhattan Bank. At that time, it was on 46th or 47th Street and the Avenue of the Americas. Now, this is April 1963. There were no banks open on Saturday. There were no ATM machines, okay? You understand? So I go into the Chase Bank and, and you know, I, I, I had never been, I had never, I'd, I'd been in the bank and I'd seen where a bank vault is, you know? But I, aside from gangster movies and so forth, I had never seen the inside of a vault. So I go into the bank and there's this huge uh, a vault with a big, like a wheel. They turn the wheel and the steel door opened. The steel, the door is that thick, you know? And, you, and, and I'm standing just outside watching uh, Mr. Rockefeller and, um, and, um, and one of the bank officers, officials, go inside. And I look inside the vault and there from floor to ceiling, nothing but money, okay? As I got closer, and I, uh, some of it was in cellophane wrap. Some of it, some money was in, there were canvas bags, and I just assumed that there was money in those canvas bags. They came out with $100,000 in cash. To, and I said, this, 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 we, we hope this can help. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful, so in gratitude, and I, and I said, well, you know, you have to sign for this. So I figured, sure, I'd sign for it, and I'll sign for the receipt. Oh, no, 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 Mr. Jones, you need to go over and see so-and-so over there. So there's a gentleman sitting behind a, a desk at a typewriter. And, um, and he says, you know, for bank regulations purposes, we have to have some receipt of, uh, receipt of this money. And so I said, I understand now. So he says, well, what is your, what, what's your, do you have a middle name? I said, yes, what's your middle name? I said, what's this? I, well, my middle name is Benjamin. So he's, he's typing Clarence Benjamin Jones. And I said, well, what, is this your typing? He says, well, this is a, this is a promissory note. This is a demand promissory note. Now, I was a lawyer, okay? Now, there are promissory notes, and then there are demand promissory notes. A non-demand promissory notes is defined that it has a, a sum certain payable by a day certain, right? You know, you borrow, uh, you borrow $100, and you promise to pay it back one year from, from a certain date. A demand promissory note, however, is payable whenever the credit, creditor demands you repay it. The, the time period within which you have to repay it is normally defined by state statutes. In other words, you might, some statutes might say whether the demand promissory note, you gotta give the, the debtor at least three days to do it, or, or five days, or maybe giving 24 hours. But I knew it was a demand promissory note, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God. So I signed this demand promissory note, and I'm re really upset. And I get to the first thing I do when I take the money, I sign the demand promissory note. I go to a public phone and I call Harry Belafonte. I said, he says, how did it go? I said, I got the money. I said, but you never told me I had to sign a, a promissory note and a demand promissory note at that. He said, better you than me. And so I said, <laughs> so, so I said, but you have, you can afford it. I can't afford it, you know? I was, I was 30, uh, I was 32 years old, okay? <laughs> and I never took, I, did, I, I, I was in fear and trepidation. I couldn't even conceive of my telling my wife that I had signed a demand promissory note. I think, okay. Anyway, I go down, take the money. I come back in my office Tuesday morning. Receptionist says, Mr. Jones, yes. There's a messenger here from the Chase, Chase Bank. I said, really? They said, well, you handle it. No, 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 you have to come out. So I go out. And the gentleman says, you're Clarence Jones. Do you have something to indicate you have Clarence Jones? I say, yeah, I have a driver's license. I go to the driver's license, okay? 
identify myself. He gives me this envelope marked personal and confidential. I open the envelope, and there's a promissory note that I had signed. I turn it over, paid in full. What was it about the, uh, about the March on Washington and, 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 and Dr. King's speech that day? What was that? What, what, what made those conditions so uh, favorable <coughs> to have the, the, the impact <coughs> that, they, that, they, that they wound up having on, on, on American history? Well, let me just say this. That's a, that's a very appropriate and good question. Because I had heard Dr. King speak many, many times before. There was, there was the uh, confluence and convergence of some tangible and intangible factors. First, there was the March on Washington at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial. The Lincoln, secondly, the Lincoln Memorial is a memorial to the president who signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Additionally, it was on the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It was in the capital of the United States of America. It was the first time in the history of the country that there had ever been that large, that large an assembly, an assemblage, that large a gathering of people, one place, one day, at the same time. The minimum was 250,000. In reality, there were between 250 and 350,000 people there. 20 to 25 percent of those people were white. People had come from all across the country. As I write in a book, Behind the Dream, The Making the Speech of Transformed a Nation, as I said, I've seen and heard Dr. King speak many times. That person that I had seen many times speak before, same body, same voice was not the same. I had never, ever heard him speak like that before. It is as if some cosmic force had come in and taken over his body and that it, he spoke in a way like he himself was having an out-of-body experience. I'm, I'm serious. It was, it was mesmerizing. It was, and I think that he himself, I think that he himself, caught up in the moment, recognized some of these things may have gone on through his mind, that here we are, almost 350,000 people from all over the country, at the foot of the Lincoln Memorial, the person who issued the Emancipation Proclamation on the 100th anniversary in the capital of the United States, uh, 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 20 to 25 percent white people, so forth. Not to mention that it was an extraordinary, beautiful day. It was a Wednesday, okay? It was beautiful. At the time he spoke was about maybe about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm not sure, but about that time. It was. It was a powerful scene, powerful. What, what do you think that the... Uh, oh, let me just say, I'm ahead, sorry. Go right ahead. So I'm describing the event, but I'm not... So, but I want to be a, a more responsive to your question. Mm -hmm. What he did that day, he was summoning the conscience of the American people, you know? You know, prior... <coughs> Prior to Martin Luther King Jr., America, on the issue of race relations, particularly racial segregation, had been like a dysfunctional alcoholic or drug addict. You know, it had tried several times unsuccessfully to break its dependency and addiction on racial segregation. Couldn't do it. Okay, tried. And along comes this fourth generation Baptist preacher from Georgia. And what he did, he forced America 
to publicly see the contradiction between the way in which it treated 12% of its population, people of color, African Americans, and the principles and precepts enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and in our Bill of Rights of the Constitution, and summon them to have courage to embark on a peaceful, nonviolent journey to recover and redeem their soul, to break their addiction and dependency on racial segregation. That's what he did. What can, what can today's young generation, uh, <coughs> what can they learn from, 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 from your generation and the battles and struggles that, that your gen generation fought in that time? And not necessarily <coughs> um, black youth of color, but black, white, Latino, Asian, all youth. What, 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 can, they, what can they learn from the struggles of, of, of your generation? You know, you need to come, you, I need to bring you up to University of San Francisco and Stanford. You ask some very good questions. Because you know what? I believe it's going to be the young people. And guess what? I believe it's going to be when a majority, listen to me carefully, when a, majority, when a majority of young white people today, youth, when they come to see as a significant number of majority of white youth in 1963 did, to see that we can be a better country than this. We're not going to get fundamental changes or to prevent um, losing some of the progress that we had if we merely have African Americans uh, protesting in the street. It's not going to happen. Okay? It's going to raise the consciousness. Don't misunderstand me. Mm -hmm. But the basis of fundamental change occurs when you can build a coalition between the white community and the black community. It may be, and often is, that the community that's most affected, the African American, protests first. But you get fundamental change when you have a coalition. And so I say, I say that, uh, you know, it's one thing to have mastered all the techniques of transmitting information. But we have to pause a little and think about the content of what we're transmitting. I, I, I teach a course to graduates, a course to graduate students called the Art of Advocacy Speech Writing. And I am fearful that if we continue to communicate by Twitter and Facebook shorthand, that people will know, even know how to communicate and write a simple sentence. So I think we have to. Uh, 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 Young people today must simply ask themselves, what kind of country do they want to live in? Okay, I mean, I, two weeks ago, I just turned 83, okay? I'm, 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 I'm getting closer to the horizon of my life every day, okay? But it's, 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 the, it's the people of, it's the, it's the 18, to, uh, 18 to 34, 18 to 49, group of people, particularly what I call the 18 to 34 group. Okay? They want to change, they can make it happen. They can't make it happen by sitting on their computer six hours a day. Okay? And they've got to understand that power can seize nothing without a, out of demand. Change doesn't automatically, it doesn't happen inevitably. It only happens when somebody's willing to make a difference. And I've heard it said, oh, well, it takes a long time. I said, oh, hold on. Yeah, I know, but a single candle get a, illuminates the darkness. Okay. One tired woman one day in 1955 got on the bus and said, I'm tired. 
I'm going to sit right here. She sat in a section that was reserved for whites only. But she, she said that day she had, had it. Okay, Rosa Parks. One day, one day, you gotta, you know. Um, progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Famous thing that Dr. King was saying. And so, I, in order to keep prevent me from getting cynical, I like to believe that that demographic I've just, that, that age group I've described, like 18 to 34, the core group, 18 to 49, uh, not just African Americans, but white Americans, who will come to see that if they want the country to be better, it's their country. I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 when you can have a situation in Newtown, Connecticut, okay, then you can have a situation in Newtown, Connecticut, when somebody can walk in with a, a, a weapon, okay, and just kill, use guns, you know. The New York Times quoted one of the parents and said, they're killing our babies. Well, so the question is, what kind of country do we want to be? When I talk in my lecture, I'm talking about the 21st century challenges to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. One of those things I will talk about, which it's like, it's like air and water, you, gotta, you can't ignore, is the existential 24-7 presence of gun violence. Is this the kind of, I, I, I was coming in from the airport Somebody told me that there's some, they had another shooting at Purdue University. Students, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm all for academic uh, education, but if, 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 if all of these shootings continue to occur among university students, I have to ask myself, well, what kind of things are they teaching these young people? <laughs> what goes on <laughs> in these colleges and universities that is stimulating people to go out and shoot? So the question is, what kind of country do we want to live in? Dr. King, in August 28, 1963, he summoned the conscience of America. He said, we can be better than this. We can be, when he spoke about his dream, he wasn't speaking in the present tense. He wasn't speaking about the, the next day, the weekend. I have a dream that someday my four children will future tense. He wasn't, okay? So, we have to decide, do we want to live in a country where they can go and randomly kill our babies? That's what we have to decide. We've been talking today with Clarence B. Jones. He's a visiting professor at the University of San Francisco and a scholar writer at the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. Clarence Jones, thank you so much for coming out and talk with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today for Cape Chronicle. The program is a collaboration between the Department of Mass Media at Southeast Missouri State University, City of Cape Girardeau, and KRCU, the public radio station for Southeast Missouri. Our executive producer is Jim Dufek. I'm Jacob McClellan. Thanks for watching.